Chaos exists to improve health outcomes for BC, Canada, and the world. Learn more at chaos.ubc.ca. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for what I think is going to be a very interesting session today. Um, my name is Amy Salmon. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the session and introduce our speakers today. Um, before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude and humility that our event is happening today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Um, I'm excited to introduce our speakers today. We have three presenters who will be speaking on the topic of citizen science, a method to engage the public in asking and answering novel research questions. Um, our three speakers today, um, Dr. Cody Primo is a postdoctoral fellow at the Arthritis Research uh, Canada. His postdoctoral work focuses on the experiences with healthcare and living with pain and long COVID for individuals who identify as a sexual or gender minority. Dr. Uh, Linda Lee is a chaos scientist, a professor, and the Harold Robertson Arthritis Society Chair in the UBC Department of Physical Therapy, as well as a senior scientist at Arthritis Research Canada and a physiotherapist at the Mary Pat Arthritis Program at Vancouver General Hospital. Uh, Dr. Lee also holds a Canada Research Chair in Patient-Oriented Knowledge Translation. And Allison Holmes is a clinical professor and knowledge broker at the UBC Department of Physical Therapy. She is also an affiliate knowledge broker with the Arthritis Research Canada and a research associate at CHAOS. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, Amy, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Our sincere thanks to Chaos for the invitation to present, and our gratitude to each one of you for taking the time during a very busy day uh, to join us. Next slide, please. First, uh, we would like to acknowledge uh, that we are residing on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Please take a moment to acknowledge and reflect on the lands from which you're joining today's session. Next slide, please. When Chaos kindly approached me to provide a work in progress session, I reflected upon the many projects that I have the privilege of contributing to as a knowledge broker. I selected the Citizen Science Platform project as it clearly stands out to me as a relatively novel methodology for engaging the public in science. And I'm confident that after today's presentation, you will feel the same way. So we have two primary components on today's uh, agenda. First is to introduce you to the citizen science platform. And then Dr. Primo will be discussing a demonstration project using the platform to engage with sexual and or gender minority populations to co-develop research questions. Next slide, please. As introduced by Amy, it's a pleasure to co-present with Drs. Cody Permo and Linda Lee. I'm grateful that they both generously agreed to share this important work. And now over to Dr. Lee for an introduction to the concept of citizen science and a journey in the development of the citizen science platform. Thank you so much, Allison. So I have the pleasure to, you know, introduce to you this platform that we've developed um, in the last few years as a way to engage the public and patients to uh, co-develop research questions. So the citizen science platform, our vision is really to transform how people engage in research about the burden of symptoms, a variety of symptoms that, um, that uh, um, we, we are talking about. And our uh, focus on a few um, um, areas that we've developed so far. So what we meant by citizen scientists, these are really people who um, with lived experience and are interested in contributing 
learning about and shaping science and want to share and help to collect information, which you know, to us, those are the data that are so important um, to um, understand uh, different questions or different issues around um, health and healthcare. Next slide, please. So the citizen science platform was conceived in 2018. Um, we consulted with a, a, um, a variety of uh, stakeholders, health professionals, in, uh, health researchers, as well as uh, patients with chronic conditions. And we come up with the idea to start the citizen, citizen science platform to focus on the burden of pain. In 2019, we spent a lot of time to co-build the, um, the, the structure and the platform uh, with um, patient partners and clinicians and uh, as well as data scientists. And we did usability testing iteratively to improve the um, engagement and the look and feel of the platform. So in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, we launched the platform. Um, 2021, we have a an opportunity to work on a few versions of data visualization using the data that's contributed by, um, by the public on a citizen science platform. And we're gonna show, show you a little bit of um, how it works in a moment. And um, with the collaboration with the post-COVID interdisciplinary clinical care network, we were able to build on top of the burden of pain uh, component to have now a, uh, an area to look at the burden of long COVID symptoms. Um, next slide, please. So long COVID is, is a good fit. Um, in using the citizen science to engage um, with people who have the lived experiences. Now, people with long COVID, as you know, there are many, you know, puzzling symptoms that, you know, sort of linger for, for a period of time. Um, people's experiences are different. Some of them will seek health care and some of them don't. And the current data that's being collected in clinical registries or um, a, a variety of research projects are really focusing on people who are in the healthcare system. But we all, we, we all know that there are a lot of people with long COVID symptoms are managing the, um, the, the conditions on, on their own and may not have access um, healthcare for whatever reasons. So we also want to hear about their experiences as well. And that's what Citizen Science Platform is, um, is designed for. It's not only for people who have a chance to access healthcare and, um, and, and um, contribute their experiences, but everyone who have um, uh, uh, lived with long COVID and, um, and have something that they want to contribute to help building research question, developing research question, that they'll be able to contribute information in this platform. So um, the questionnaires that we have a variety of questionnaires included in the citizen science platform, which you see on this slide. Um, we ask people about um, their demographic information, their, um, their employment status. We ask them about uh, their current need and how the long COVID symptoms affect their everyday lives. We also have uh, questions asking about their um, medical condition, their health status, their um, smoking histories. We uh, look at quality of life. And also we have a space where people can contribute um, their stories about living with long COVID. We, we sort of you know, have a, uh, guiding questions and a space for people to tell their own stories. So with the data that's being contributed by uh, by, by the citizen scientists, they allow us to look at what are some of the, um, the impact of the symptoms on their everyday lives, as well as their lived experiences that helps um, us to hear from, from these individuals as, um, as, as researchers we're developing research questions. And Cody is gonna be able to, uh, is going to share with you how he's gonna use that in his specific demonstration project. Uh, next slide, please. So the funding for the citizen science platform was initially from the BC support unit phase one. We also have a variety of partners. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the PCICCN um, is, a, a, um, is, a, is a major partner. The database of citizen science is hosted by Pop Data BC. So there's an advantage there because 
um, the uh, in in uh, the citizen science state, uh, phase two, which is uh, the, for the long COVID uh, burden of long COVID symptoms, we specifically ask individuals, and we've got um, UBC ethics approval to do that. We ask people for their personal health numbers, um, which is um, useful for um, in the future for us to be able to link to um, administrative data uh, in, pop, in pop data BC. So um, so it, it's just a natural space or na natural home to host the citizen science platform uh, for, 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 for our work. Um, on the right, you see that there are um, six patient partners who worked with us from day one to build the citizen science platform for long COVID. And so what you see um, live um, that, uh, uh, for, for the platform, um, you know, anything, including the images, the way we explain citizen science, the color, the font, everything or um, really um, we, we, we take the input from, from these individuals to work with us as well as our technology partner to develop this platform. Next slide, please. So the citizen science platform is a safe place for people to answer or contribute um, information about their symptoms, uh, including change, the changes of the symptoms over time. So this is not a one-off questionnaire for people to fill in. They can create an account and come back and tell us how things are changing for them over time. It allowed them to share stories and experiences, as I mentioned. And it also um, allow people to compare their own symptoms with others who are like them. So others who are also living with, living with um, COVID, long COVID symptoms um, and using our data visualization uh, set up uh, at patientscientist.ca for those of you who are interested in looking at the platform, that is the um, address to access the website. Next slide, please. So just to show you a little bit about how this works. So when you get into patientscientist.ca, you're gonna be on this landing page. It explains to you what the project is about, what is a citizen scientist and what we're trying to do. And you can see that they can uh, fill in information about the burden of pain or burden of long COVID. Uh, we're explaining to people what we're trying to uh, achieve in terms of collecting data. And also people can explore um, the data set from uh, people who contributed information. So going into this um, page here, people can um, query the database um, on specific symptoms. So we have uh, the example of brain fog, and you can see when people um, hovering over each of the, um, the bar on the chart, that you, um, they can see you know, the proportion of people who contributed data who um, had the symptom before COVID, had it during COVID, um, but disappeared, or had, or had it during COVID and is continue to have it. Now, the orange bar you see over there is that when um, pe if people want to look at specific characteristics of individuals who contribute information. So in that case, it was all the um, female, uh, people identify as female who contributed information. And you can see the proportion of um, uh, um, female um, going side by side with everyone who um, contributed data. And you can also filter by uh, geographic location. So for in British Columbia, as an example, um, I'm gonna, uh, Cody. I'm gonna get you to uh, ask you to stop the video for a bit. So the data set for people to query the uh, the data set. Uh, sorry, the, the data set itself is um, uh, updated every 24 hours. So um, it's not immediate real time. It's not as much as we like, but it's real time enough that people can come back and, you know, as data being collected and they want to see how each of the symptoms um, are, uh, 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 what people are saying about each of the symptoms and how it looks like in, you know, using the specific um, filters that uh, people can, um, people would like to um, uh, look at. So um, next slide, please. So just to tell you a little bit about the usage of citizen science to date. So we have about 5,000 visits to the citizen science website. And of those, about 300 of them fill out some information, share with us some information about uh, long COVID. 
Um, 200 of those individuals fill out all the questionnaires that um, we have on the website, which is fantastic. Now, the, um, the orange bubble on the right-hand side, it says that the landing page conversion rate is about 6%. Now, it doesn't look like much, but if you look at the industry standard for how people engage with a website and subsequently do something with the website, um, so, so for example, you know, people go into a site that are asking them to fill out a questionnaire or to make a purchase or something like that. Um, the conversion, the landing page con conversion rate usually is about one to four percent. So six percent for us is is actually very encouraging, meaning that if we can drive people to the citizen science website, uh, 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 people will tend will tend to move forward to contribute data um, in the in the website. So so this is certainly very encouraging, and we encourage each one of you, if you know someone have long COVID symptoms and would like to share their stories, their experiences, to come to visit us and, and share their information and be a citizen scientist. Um, so, sorry. And so, um, and, and uh, 165 people contributed their stories. And I mentioned that in uh, individuals who are from uh, British Columbia, who is interested in sharing with us their personal health data for data linkage, uh, we welcome them to do so. And there's 71 individuals uh, have already um, consented and, and shared their uh, PHN with us. So at this stage, we, we are encouraged, but we certainly would need a lot more help uh, to drive people to the website and work with us. Um, Citizen Science 3.0, uh, we have a collaboration with the newly funded Long COVID Web. There are two things that we would like to do. One is to have the, uh, the, the platform translated into French language so that we can make it fully a national platform. And we also want to improve the reminder system for to encourage citizen, citizen scientists to come back and tell us more about their experiences. Um, we're proud to say that the citizen science project, the platform, is one of the 50 projects that's listed uh, in the Government of Canada citizen science portal. Um, so I, well, I, I would invite uh, everyone to go take a look. There are actually a, a variety of really neat citizen science projects, not a lot in health, but you know we, we're, we're happy to say that we're one of the first um, that, that's, um, that's ongoing in Canada. So um, with that, I'm going to pass back to Allison to talk about the long COVID web. Yes, as mentioned by Linda, we, along with many BC scientists, are thrilled to be collaborators in the CIHR-funded national initiative to coordinate long COVID research and care. Um, if you're interested in the, in the web and its activities and all of its contributing members, uh, you'll see the URL there to, um, to the website. Uh, the citizen science platform is one of several methods that are going to be leveraged by the long COVID web to engage with Canadians living with post COVID condition. Next slide, please. I'd just like to highlight in this slide and the subsequent slide uh, two key features of the platform. First, the citizen science platform, as mentioned by Linda, is hosted by Pop Data BC using a custom built architecture of four servers that are designed to ensure compliance with security and privacy requirements. So, working from the uh, left to right on the screen here, the first server is dedicated to authentication. The second to confirmation, password reset and emails, PHN tracking and data aggregation. The third is exclusively dedicated to all identifying information. And the fourth to the data visualizations that Linda uh, shared with you, as well as the sharing of de-identified data with researchers who can use this platform uh, to answer, to identify and answer their own research questions. Next slide, please. 
The final feature that I would like to highlight is that equity, diversity, and inclusion was integrated into the design of the citizen science platform. We use the Progress Plus framework to inform the demographic information that was collected um, by the citizen science website to help understand both the burden of pain and the burden of long COVID symptoms. So without further ado now, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Primo, who's going to share with you how he is utilizing the citizen science platform uh, in a novel way. And this, this will be an illustration, perhaps a catalyst, we hope, for others to do similar. Thank you for passing it along. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about how can we maximize public involvement in identifying meaningful research questions. And specifically, uh, for my postdoctoral work, I'm planning to look at this question. So what research questions are meaningful to individuals who identify as a sexual and or gender minority related to living with pain? Now, I'm sure a lot of us are aware that there's a large public interest in better understanding pain. And there have been a few studies that have shown that pain prevalence is greater in individuals who identify as a sexual and or gender minority, or SGM for short. And essentially, um, when we, we use this term, we're describing individuals who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, intersex, pansexual, asexual, and additional identities not considered heterosexual and cisgender. And from these studies that have shown that pain is greater in these populations, it's looked primarily at uh, reports of overall pain, uh, more widespread pain, meaning that uh, pain is located in three or more sites, and uh, more chronic pain. However, it's important to note that this comes from primarily uh, secondary analyses using administrative data in the US. And we really don't have any information of how it applies in the Canadian context, where these data are focused uh, primarily on prevalence. And it's also important to note that these data rely on individuals who participate and access healthcare. Uh, and when speaking specifically about individuals uh, from the sexual and gender minority communities, there have been several studies that have shown uh, that individuals may delay or forego healthcare due to a number of reasons, um, primarily related to negative experiences with healthcare, um, which means that these individuals may not necessarily uh, be showing up in, in these type of data that we're collecting. We also have yet to explore the why. Why do we see that individuals from the SGM community experience more pain? We really have limited knowledge of lived experiences with pain uh, from the, the basis of individuals who identify as SGM. And there's a lack of representativeness of sexual and gender minority individuals in health research, pain research included in this. Um, so in terms of patient partnerships, in the co-designing and developing of research interventions um, and uh, policy making, uh, setting research priorities as well. Also in terms of research participant demographics, uh, and, and that comes down also to the way that we collect data. And at the end of the day, there's also a few studies that include individuals who are transgender, non-binary, um, and, and often individuals from sexual and gender minority groups get kind of lumped into one category, where it's important to acknowledge that uh, individual experiences can be different depending on how an individual identifies. And this can also present logistical challenges in conducting research that recognizes those different experiences, where we need uh, a larger input from individuals to help inform directions of, of the work that we do. So we know that individuals who identify as sexual and gender minority experience greater pain in some capacity, but we have yet to explore the why, uh, nor, and, and we haven't explored lived experiences with pain in individuals who identify as sexual and gender minority. So at this stage, we lack the knowledge uh, about the most meaningful research questions in, in the eyes of individuals who identify as sexual and gender minority and the optimal starting point for research. So this got me thinking, well, can sexual and gender minority individuals public input and experiences with pain help us inform the co-development and shaping of meaningful research questions? There's a number of methodological considerations that we need to take into account with this, where our goal here is to try and maximize public and patient engagement. 
And um, this takes into account the fact that, as I mentioned, we're looking at a diversity of different perspectives here. Uh, there's a variety of different sexual and gender minority identities and additional identities that contribute to uh, an, an individual's overall identity of who they are as individuals. We also want to be thinking about uh, geographical flexibility. So being able to capture nationwide perspectives, including rural and uh, remote communities who typically don't have as easy access to be able to share and, and contribute to the research process and, and in developing research questions. We also want to be aware of um, time flexibility. So having the ability to participate whenever um, is most convenient for the individual. So being able to access a platform at, at the individual's leisure, as well as opportunities for multiple public engagement where individuals can continue to share information as much as they would like. Another important consideration is that um, we need to have an opportunity for anonymous engagement contributions, particularly when working with individuals of sexual and gender minority groups who may not necessarily feel comfortable sharing um, information due to the historical um, stigmatization and discrimination against individuals from sexual and gender minority groups, which may make them um, less comfortable sharing information in a research context um, or self-disclosing themselves. Um, so being able to provide that type of information in a safe place is really important. So how do we do this? If we think about the traditional research design, we have the identification of a research problem um, by a researcher or a group of researchers where uh, there's some kind of a gap that we find. And this would be followed by some form of a review of literature. And if, if we find that these questions have not been answered, then it, it develops these research questions and hypotheses, which subsequently lead to designing of a study and collection of data. Now, if we think of where we would typically see in this traditional design uh, input coming from patients and uh, members of the public, it generally happens after this stage um, where you know, we have questions that have already been developed and we're asking individuals to, to come in um, at, the, at that stage to co-collaborate and, and, and share information and, and work towards a greater goal of, of achieving this, this answering of a question that we're looking at. Um, and, and this has a lot of value and, and can provide a lot of great insights. But I started to think, is, is there another way that we can do it? Is there some way, if we're looking at the question that we have, um, you know, what research questions are meaningful to individuals who identify as a sexual and or gender minority related to living with pain? Can we start that earlier in the process? Because we know that greater pain is experienced by individuals of the SGM community. But when we look at the literature, the literature is really sparse. There's not a whole lot of information that can help guide us in developing research questions and, and planning our next steps, even though we know that there's a problem and there's a gap that needs to be filled. We also have a lack of input on lived experience from sexual and gender minority communities at this point. And we think that this can really help inform our future directions in this work. There's also really no set research priorities because we don't have a whole lot of information to, to build off of. So the way that, um, you know, having discussions with uh, Linda and Allison and, and, and seeing how we can move this in a different direction, we think, what if we get engagement earlier on in the process before the identification of a research problem? So if we reorganize this algorithm a little bit, and we, we've talked about citizen science and the premise behind it, um, we, we, we're essentially getting public input uh, through citizen science where individuals share um, their experiences with symptoms and their lived experiences with pain and or long COVID. In this case, um, we're looking at a question related to pain. Now, this happens on a continuous basis where uh, an individual can identify a research problem after that information has already been shared by the public. And um, when we have that research problem, we can form a group of individuals, a working group, um, in this case of individuals who identify a sexual and gender minority, to review and analyze the pain experiences that was collected um, through citizen science and draw meaning from it to collaboratively develop uh, research questions with patient and public partners, which ultimately can lead to the co-design of studies and co-collection of data. 
And when we look at it this way, we're really getting patient and public input at all stages of the research process, even before the identification of a research problem. Now, how is citizen science different than survey research? Well, the infrastructure is already set. We have a, a number of different questions that we ask individuals um, that has provided information or data that's already been collected at the time of data request by the researcher. And uh, this information is coming directly from public input who have shared their experiences with pain through citizen science. And this methodology enables research evolution and knowledge advances where the public is actually involved in the process of the development of research questions. And this can be particularly useful in terms of methodology when the literature and or public input on a particular topic is sparse. So where do we start? For my postdoctoral work, um, it, it begins with formation of a working group. So this working group will collaborate through the entire program to uh, co-develop, co-design, um, and, and progress together through each of the stages of the research program. Now, um, to develop this working group, and this is something that we've begun and we're in the process of doing, um, it's we're looking at connecting with individuals with lived experience with pain and who identify as sexual and gender minorities or individuals uh, with pain expertise or working with sexual and gender minority populations. And this involves patients, public caregivers, uh, clinicians and researchers. And uh, as Allison was talking about earlier, we really want to make sure that we're getting unique, diverse experiences and that we're capturing the perspectives of individuals from a variety of different backgrounds and identities. Um, so in, in the selection and of our working group, we really want to make sure that uh, we're following the, the concepts of the Progress Plus framework uh, to ensure that we capture more diverse perspectives. In terms of how we are connecting with individuals, some of it comes from word of mouth. So um, collaborations with individuals that I've worked with in the past or that members of the team have worked with in the past, um, or, or you know, this person knows this person who is interested in this work. Um, social media is another way that uh, we've been able to connect with some individuals. Um, Twitter has been particularly helpful with this as well as um, other opportunities, uh, you know, through Instagram or um, other avenues. Sexual and gender minority community events. So myself, um, I identify as a gay man and I do participate in um, some community events that are focused on um, sexual and gender minority community building and uh, connections are built in those types of environments as well. Uh, more of that in-person, um, you know, meaningful connection that can be built in that perspective as well. Through patient-led and community organizations, uh, for example, through Arthritis Research Canada, we have a close relationship with the Arthritis um, <clears throat> Patient Advisory Board uh, and individuals who um, have lived experience with pain uh, and have expressed interest in being involved in this work as well. Um, and another option is through tailored recruitment materials. So again, this is kind of an ongoing process for us, um, but we've made some, some good headway with this so far uh, and we'll continue to build this working group. Now in talking specifically about the types of information that are being collected through uh, citizen science related to pain, it's important for us to be able to answer these questions that we get public input from the sexual and gender minority community. Now, usually um, in, in the context of citizen science, we already have sufficient data that's already been collected. However, given that this platform is relatively young, we still need more input from individuals of sexual and gender minority communities to share their experiences with pain. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit as we move forward about how we're planning to encourage individuals to engage and contribute experiences with pain through the platform. But I'd like to highlight a key component here once the engagement has already occurred and individuals have um, engaged with the platform and shared their experiences through citizen science, these data are accessible to anyone for future use. So think of it as kind of this ongoing building of shared information of patient symptoms and lived experiences to help develop additional research questions and priorities. So in this context, we're, we're looking to engage with individuals from sexual and gender minority communities, um, but that, that's only like a subgroup of individuals who have 
additional uh, parts of their identity um, and, and experience different types of symptoms that uh, can help answer other questions that are unrelated to um, you know, sexual orientation or gender identity. So it's kind of building a, a big pool of information that is provided by the public who are sharing their information. Um, so to be able to encourage individuals of sexual and gender minority to engage with the platform, we will co-develop a comprehensive engagement plan with our working group. And the goal of this is to maximize opportunities for public engagement in sexual and gender minority settings. And to be able to do this, we need to approach it from two angles, um, through in-person engagement and online engagement. In person engagement, we plan to maximize the opportunities through sexual and, gen sexual and gender minority community spaces. Uh, so things like pride events, uh, community organization events, as well as providing visuals, um, like posters and flyers in sexual and gender minority centers. So posters where individuals can learn about um, the citizen science platform uh, and have information provided where they, they can contribute and share, um, as well as flyers that can be provided through um, ba bags that are given um, for promotion at uh, different events. And, and these are just a few examples. And online, we really want to uh, maximize opportunities for engagement where individuals from sexual and gender minority communities frequent. Um, so social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, for example, uh, dating apps that are more tailored to individuals of sexual and gender minority. So places like uh, Grindr, Her, Scruff, among others, as well as uh, community and uh, organization websites and forums where uh, individuals who are visiting these sites can see um, that there is a, this platform where they can share their experiences and contribute towards um, science and, and, and developing um, the co-developing the, these questions. And uh, other opportunities include through radio and podcast, um, so connecting with local stations, um, as well as sharing through champions, individuals who uh, have been known for adv advocacy in, in committing to um, you know, the sexual and gender minority communities and, and promoting um, improvements in health outcomes for these individuals can really help spread the message um, to individuals who follow them. To talk a little bit more about some of the questions uh, that are looked at in the platform related to pain, so we talked about some of the ones for the long COVID platform earlier, uh, we're looking at information related to uh, demographics, experiences with pain, uh, diagnosed health conditions, healthcare consultations over the last 12 months, medication use, uh, and lifestyle. So things like alcohol consumption, sleep, uh, activity levels, and social stress levels. We're also looking at uh, individuals sharing information about the health-related quality of life, um, as well as looking at um, some of the content provided by the VR12. So uh, the, the mental and physical component scores that come from this questionnaire, as well as uh, the valuation of lost productivity. So a productivity or day-to-day -day productivity that's affected by an individual's given health condition. There are also uh, opportunities to share open text responses where individuals can talk about their theories and uh, their stories related to living with pain. In terms of theories, we ask individuals in their view what causes the pain that they've experienced and what do they think makes their pain better uh, or makes it worse. We also ask them uh, what else they would like us to know about their pain and how uh, they manage their pain. So what do we plan to do with this data? So for my postdoctoral work, as I mentioned throughout the talk so far, we were looking at a particular demographic of individuals. So individuals who self-report as a sexual and or gender minority, and to be able to isolate the subgroup of individuals who've contributed to uh, citizen science and shared their information, uh, we're gonna be using the sexual orientation and gender identity questions to identify those individuals and um, look at these data. So I'm gonna give two examples of how we plan to use this data and some of the research questions that may be able to be generated from it. If we're looking from a quantitative lens, I've talked about some of the patient reported measures and the additional variables that are collected through the platform. 
And um, what I'm planning to do is explore associations of the, some of these variables with pain and health-related quality of life, and doing this through uh, linear and logistic regressions. Plan to also look at these analyses um, by separating based on sexual and gender minority identities um, and by health conditions um, as well in the future. So I'll give an example here where we're trying to explore the association of multiple variables with pain severity in individuals who identify as sexual and gender minority and experience pain. So let's say hypothetically, we were to find an association um, between the number of health consults and pain severity, where fewer health consultations over the last 12 months is associated with greater pain severity. Now, I'm going to be talking in a few slides about the process that we plan to use um, for actually developing the questions uh, by working alongside our working group. But as an example, one of the questions that may come from these data is, is reduced healthcare utilization related to previous negative experiences with healthcare? And if we show that, you know, that yes, this, this may be the case, that may prompt additional questions such as, you know, what strategies can be used to improve access to care for individuals of sexual and gender minority? I want to highlight as well, again, that we can explore it from uh, multiple lenses, and I plan to do this, where we look at if that relationship differs among um, individuals from a variety of different sexual and gender minority identities, because uh, that's also a big gap in the information that we have right now, where we, we kind of lump individuals of sexual and gender minority as, as one group of individuals, but lived experiences can be quite variable uh, among different identities. When looking at uh, the open text responses, again, we have theories about pain uh, and stories about uh, living with pain. And with these data, we plan to do a thematic analysis where we're going to generate important themes that help identify underlying meaning, experiences, and perspectives uh, that are conveyed by the content that is provided, again, through the public who are sharing information about their own experiences. And again, here we want to look at how these may vary among uh, sexual and gender minority identities and by health condition. So as an example, if we're looking at individuals' personal stories with pain, as we're going through these data and we, we complete our analysis, we find that a recurring theme is that some individuals have challenges in managing their pain due to drug interactions between gender affirming treatments that they're seeking and the medications that they need to take for a particular condition that they have to help manage symptoms. Now, this can pose a large dilemma for a number of individuals because they're, they're kind of given a choice of deciding between uh, gender affirming treatment where it's going to allow them to live in the body that they identify with and feel most comfortable in, while also um, having to weigh that with taking medications to help manage their symptoms. So that may lead to a research question, like what alternative strategies can we use to help individuals manage symptoms in a gender affirming way? So again, those are just two examples of questions that may come from the data that we generate from public input. Um, and, and essentially these questions would be developed um, collaboratively with members of our working group. So to highlight how we plan to do this, it will be through discussion workshops and using the idea of group concept mapping. So with uh, group concept mapping, we'll have our working group, again, who identify as sexual and gender minority and experience pain uh, from the lens of patients and public uh, researchers, um, caregivers, and uh, individuals will explore the citizen science data and discuss uncertainties around pain in sexual and gender minority communities. And what we plan to do is leverage the discussions from um, these groups to enhance the citizen science data and to co-develop research questions that are important to individuals of sexual and gender minority communities. The, the really great thing about group concept mapping um, and with this particular area is that Integrating the citizen science data with the input um, from the working group can help us create map clusters to guide planning of future directions. So if we look on the right hand side here, um, you can see these kind of points, which theoretically would represent different areas and research questions uh, that are identified by the group that would need to be explored in future work. And you can see they kind of cluster around topics that are more related to one another. And what group concept mapping allows us to do is 
as you can see in the bottom right hand corner here, map it into different categories, which essentially could lend itself to the development of research programs that aim to answer a number of questions that are related to one another. Um, so it really helps us kind of categorize and plan for future work. It's also important for us to talk about co-prioritization of these research questions. So in order to achieve this and kind of establish uh, where our future directions and our plans are, we're gonna be doing a modified Delphi, um, which uses an iterative process of repeat rounds to reach consensus on uh, these research questions that were co-developed by the working group through group concept mapping and has also been informed through public input with citizen science. Now, with this uh, Delphi process, the public is who we're going to be engaging um, once again, and uh, the public will be able to evaluate research questions to rate the usefulness of the questions and provide additional input to the questions that were developed by the working group based off of the public information that was shared. So that would be round one. And then in the subsequent rounds, uh, individuals would rate the importance of the questions that we've kind of tailored a little bit more and, and uh, refined. So the working group would meet between each of these different rounds to discuss and refine the questions. And at the end, we essentially would collate the results to summarize uh, final priority rankings uh, for future action and directions with this work. So this is kind of to give an overview again of how citizen science can really help us in developing meaningful research questions that are informed by the public and information and lived experience provided by the public. Now, just to give an overview again of, of the value of, of this type of methodology is um, the existing data is obtained through citizen science uh, at, and at the time of data request. So for anyone who's interested in working with these data, we kind of have this continuous engagement like we can see on the top right hand corner here um, over time. So as more and more individuals engage with the platform and share their information, it leads to greater public input on experiences with pain. And this can provide rich insights into symptoms as, as reported by individuals, but also lived experiences of the public that can help inform the development of meaningful research questions. And this can be particularly beneficial, as I mentioned, in areas where the literature is sparse and with little information to work from and with no specific research questions, um, such as the example that I provided today. And there's a lot of value for the public and for patients as well. Um, as Linda was talking about earlier, there's um, data visualizations that are provided on the platform where individuals can compare symptoms and experiences to individuals with similar demographics and get kind of that real-time feedback um, of the information that they're sharing and see how it compares to others. There's also opportunity for individuals uh, to participate more than once and almost track their pain over time um, and share experiences and how that, that evolves and changes with time. And ultimately, future research used to guide policies will be informed by public lived experience from this. At the, at the end of this talk, we're, we're hoping that we've kind of got people thinking a little bit. Um, and at, we have this question of, you know, can accessing existing citizen science data on lived experiences with pain and or long COVID help you with the work that you do? And if you're interested in accessing the data, um, please contact the data steward, uh, Dr. Linda Lee. Um, her email is here, but I'm actually gonna move to the next slide, uh, which provides contact information for each of us. Um, we have the website again, so patientscientist.ca, uh, where we have the platform if you wanna learn more information. There's also uh, our Twitter um, that you can connect with us on as well, and uh, each of our personal contact information. And with that, I'll pass it back to Amy for questions. Thank you all very much.